a Living History production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, Happy New Year, welcome to 2020. I can't quite believe I'm saying the words 2020, it uh, seems quite unbelievable, where is the time going? But welcome to a new year and we've got a whole heap of wonderful new history content coming up for you in 2020, so thank you for joining me on that journey. Now, we are doing content in January, it's going to be a little bit erratic because we are preparing some pretty amazing things that are coming up from February onwards. We've got new podcasts that we're launching, new documentaries, a whole range of exciting new history announcements to make later in the year, so bear with us in January. The content is not going to be as regular as it has been in the past, but as soon as we get to February, we'll be right back on track. So we're going to kick off this week with quite an interesting audio file. This was taken from my documentary that is now available on YouTube about Bletchley Park. And I had the fortune last year of going to Bletchley Park and spending an entire day there and meeting the people and touring the entire site. This, of course, is the site where the incredibly talented code breakers cracked the German Enigma code, amongst many other codes as well. But it's most famous for cracking the German Enigma code during the Second World War. And I spent the day there. I got to explore all the buildings, see the famous sites where people like Alan Turing worked on breaking these codes. But the absolute highlight was I got to play with an Enigma machine. I got to spend a couple of hours learning all about it, seeing how it works, and coding and decoding messages. It was just a wonderful experience the whole day I spent at Bletchley Park. So this documentary, you can watch it now on YouTube. It's called Bletchley Park Decoding Enigma. Uh, but as a special treat, here's the audio file for podcast listeners so you can listen to everything that went on at Bletchley Park. So listen to the file, go to YouTube, download the documentary, and I will see you soon with more great history content. In the darkest days of World War II, Britain's brightest and best gathered at this country estate to do battle with the Nazi war machine. Led by cryptographers, including Alan Turing and Gordon Welchman, their challenge was to crack Germany's impregnable cipher machine, Enigma. And their prize? Nothing short of victory in World War II. Come with me as I walk in the footsteps of the men and women who made history at Bletchley Park. This is Decoding Enigma. Jonathan, it's a remarkable building. What is this and why is this the focal point uh, of Bletchley Park? This is the building we, we know as the mansion. Uh, it was built in the late 19th century by uh, local businessman Sir Herbert Leon and was um, bought by the government with the, in the 1930s as a a war station, as they called it, for the, the code breakers, the government code and cipher school. So why why was Bletchley chosen as the focal point for the code breaking? Well, it was important to have somewhere outside of London uh, because of the risk of enemy bombing. To uh, A lot of government uh, departments and organisations did exactly the same thing. But actually it was very convenient because it was by, had very good connections with London, the rail, both road and rail, also with Oxford and Cambridge, where some of the first recruits like Alan Turing uh, came from. and. Thirdly, there was a very good uh, telecommunications line, so all the uh, electronic communications that Bletchley needed to, to uh, receive the intercepted enemy messages and to send out the, uh, the, the, the intelligence reports, there was already the infrastructure to, to be able to do that. So when did this building become part of the, the, the code-breaking operation? Uh, 1938, it was bought by the, the head of MI6, uh, who was also the head of Government Code and Cipher School. It was used uh, during the Munich crisis in, in 1938 when there was the risk of war with Germany and, and it was used as a sort of like a rehearsal almost for what happened a year later. In, uh, after the Munich crisis the code breakers moved back to London but then came here again in the middle of August 1939 when it looked fairly obvious that war with Germany w w was looming and at that time as well as the existing 150 or so staff from London that's when people like Alan Turing uh, Gordon Welshman, who were on this list of, of clever people who could be used in, in time of war, started to arrive. How many people worked at Bletchley Park over in, the course of the war? In total, by uh, well, the, the greatest number uh, towards the end of the war was nearly 9,000. And that's why they had to build all the huts that you'll see later, all, all the brick blocks as the place expanded so much. But I should also stress it wasn't just at Bletchley Park that the code breaking activity happened because you needed sites where enemy signals were intercepted, so you needed wireless operators, what were known as Y stations. 
you needed the, uh, the, the teams to uh, uh, transmit Bletchley Park's products to the, 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 the political and military leaders who needed to, to be able to read the intelligence. So there were probably, with all these other tasks, there were about probably about another 9,000 people. So getting on for 20,000 people working either, either at or for Bletchley Park by, the, uh, by late 1944. Just extraordinary. Shall we go and have a look inside? Let's, let's do that, yes. Mm. It's a beautiful building. It is, yeah. Wow. What was this building used for, Jonathan, before it became this central area for code breaking? Well, it was a, it was a private house, a, a big private house belonging to Sir Herbert Leon, a local uh, businessman and briefly in, in the very early years of the 20th century, a Liberal MP. He was going to pull the, the house down and build houses, new houses on, on it. But it was bought instead by the government. And as you can see, it's set up um, as, a, as, an, as it would have been an office uh, during the Second World War. Probably it's supporting the very senior people like Commander Denniston, the head of government at Kerbin Cipher School, preparing his, his the reports that he was then sending to Churchill from decrypted enemy communications. We're now going into Commander Denniston's office. Commander Denniston was the head of government code and cipher school at Bletchley Park for the first few years of the war. And um, he'd been working for the organisation since the First World War in, in signals intelligence. And he was the man responsible for the idea that we should, with war approaching, the organisation should recruit people of, with the skills uh, who, who, that we needed for, for code breaking. So that's why people like Alan Turing were recruited. Uh, it was planned, well planned before the war, so that on the, I think, I think Alan Turing arrived on the 4th of September, the day after, after the war started. It was, that, it was that slick an operation. So some of the key decisions, well effectively of the war, would yeah. have been made in this room where we're standing uh, right now? Certainly decisions as far as the people we need to do this, the organisation that needs to be set up, uh, the scale of it, you know, all the decisions uh, about that would have been, had their origins in discussions probably in this room with the, the senior people who worked at, at Fletcher Park like Alan Turing and uh, uh, Gordon Welchman, some of the well-known names of, of the story here. At the centre of the efforts to break the German codes was a single truly remarkable piece of technology, the Enigma machine. Wow. So here it is. This is an original Enigma machine, um, an authentic original one that was used by the Germans in the Second World War. So what's in this box would have been used by a German the, messenger during uh, the Second World War during, to send coded Enigma messages? Totally. There were about 85, 90,000 of these made in the Second World War because every division of the German Army, Air Force and Navy would need uh, an Enigma machine to be able to encipher and decipher messages. So this is one of those original 85,000 machines. Wow. Can I have a look? You can indeed, there's just a catch on the front. There you go. Wow. It is an amazing piece of technology, which we'll, we'll work through. Um, but um, yeah, if we pull down the front as well, you'll see that these, um, these wires if, um, on the plug board, they also play an integral part in how complicated and how advanced this cipher machine was that the Germans developed throughout the 1920s and 1930s. And you were saying, Phil, this is the actual machine that was used in the imitation game. It was. It? This is a film star. Um, <laughs> this is a, um, I, we do make a joke quite often. It's a Hollywood film star, but the acting's a little bit wooden. But, <laughs> but um, yeah. So, so how so does it work? Right, OK. I mean, so you give me the rare privilege of actually using an Enigma oh. machine, how, how do I even begin? Oh, well, let, let's break it down first. So we've got, obviously, the rotors are the essential Indeed. part of the code in yep. here. Then the, is it the plug board? Plug board the on the front. Okay. Um, and it's the combination of the plug board, the wire settings, and the rotors, and which rotors are being used in what setting position, produces the fantastically huge number of different possibilities um, you need to know to be able to read the ciphers. So the, the, the operator would type on this keyboard here. That's right. And then these lights would light up. That's right. And that's, so what that, that's what they would write down. This was so the, the, the plain text went in here and the coded message came out depending on which light. Effectively, yeah. So every single letter changes every single time as okay. a cipher. So, so you press a key on the keyboard, um, the electrical routing within the machine changes it into another letter and that letter is, um, as I say, signified by the, the bulb that lights up. Okay. So, should we give it a go? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Uh, we turn it on first of all. Um, like all machines, it needs a power source. 
I guess if you just press any key, press it nice and firm and hard okay, to the bottom. So I'll press S. And you'll see it's... And F. Comes that's up, right, let's change it to S. Um, F. Press S again for me. Yeah. And let's see what happens this time. And that's a P this it's, time. Okay. It's now a P. Okay. So actually, because, I don't know if you noticed that one of these rotors moved, so yeah. if you want to press another key, you'll see a rotor move. Oh, I see, okay. So and I press W and it's come up with M now this And time. now press W again. And now it's a B. And now it's B. So the rotor moving each time is changing the direction of electrical current that goes through the machine. Okay. And therefore that's producing the cipher. The key to this is, as you say, the work that normally the operators would work in pairs. One person would be typing the letters and a colleague would be writing down the letters that light, that light up. So they're always working pairs. You cannot read, it is impossible to be able to read or decipher that message unless your machine, which might be 700 miles away, the other side of Europe, is set up in an identical fashion to the sending machine. So Phil, the variables that are required to make this work, the rotors firstly can be removed, can't they? And they okay. have to be put back in in the correct order. They Indeed. have to be set on the right starting position. We have to know what order to put to plug the plugs in on the front board. Indeed. Can we have a look inside and see we how, can, this, uh, indeed. how this works with the rotors? Yeah. And as we said, we've, you can see there that we've got three rotors within the machine. Um, but in fact, for the majority of Enigma machines, there were more than three rotors. There were five. So if we, we go to this box, this is be the, the supporting um, case, we've got two more rotors here. So hang, let me get this straight. So there's three rotors that go in the machine. That's right. Yet you can choose from five, and each one is configured differently. And they have to change it every day at midnight. <laughs> so, so what we've got here, we've got um, a, a, a code sheet. And these sheets, a key sheet, these were distributed once a month um, to that particular key. And for each day, and you can see the dates of the month go from 1 up to 31, for each day they would have to reset the machine. Normally at midnight each day because they would need to correspond the time of the change, otherwise during those intervening hours they would not be able to read each other's messages or, or decipher those messages. So the example there, if we, we, we start, let's start at the top on the 31st. We've got Roman numerals here of three, five, and four. What that actually means is within the machine, can we put in rotors three, five, and four? Oh, in I see, order? there's Roman numerals just here. Exactly, and there's Roman numerals here. So we've got a Roman numeral, uh, I don't know if people will see that, but we've got Roman numeral number two on that one. So we put in three, five, and four in that order. And that was the first challenge, because rarely did Bletchley Park have access to these coaches. These were heavily protected by the German forces. Um, so three, five, and four, as we've said there, the total number of combinations for those rotors is 60. Because any three in any order from a total selection of five means there are 60 positions. But it gets increasingly more difficult. Because if we look, each of these rotors have got 26 different settings. There's 26 numbers on there, which represent the letters of the alphabet. So. Phil, do you know what I love about all this? I've got to say that it's so fantastic. It's all mechanics. There's no computers, there's no, no microchips. It's all mechanics. And I'm, I'm looking here at this rotor and I see that it's the, the basic composition is these electric contacts on this side and then the contracts and the contacts on That's the right. other side and then the, I assume, a very complicated system of wires in the middle to make random to, distributions to, to, of that signal. So correct. So every one of those 26 um, numbers which represent the 26 letters of the alphabet, inside this, each of these individual rotors, it will change it from one letter to another. So, so really what we're talking about is an electrical wire that is run through a very complicated system. Exactly. To make a signal at the other end to lead to a light bulb coming on when you press a key. It's, exactly. It's, it's incredibly simple and incredibly ingenious at the same yeah. time. It's simple and complicated uh, all at once. Well, it's amazing. Undoubtedly. And, and it is basically, yeah, as you're quite right, it's an electrical circuit but it's the most difficult electrical circuit I can imagine. How many possible combinations are there? After all of this, after plug boards, rotors, putting the rotor in, okay. setting the rotor positions, adjusting the starting positions, okay. what are the odds that I would be able to sit down? If I walked out of this room now, you did it, and I came yeah. back in, what is the chance that I could well, sit down and just guess what we, combination? We can explain it in a couple of ways. Uh, and I, I, both, both of them are mind boggling. But the total number of different combinations taken into effect taking into account all of the factors that you've, you've just mentioned, there's over 103 sextillion different possible combinations. I have no idea it's, what that number is. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. 103 sextillion. It's actually got 24 characters in it. 
So it's got this 24 digits long. This is how difficult it was. If we were to do a brute force attack, and that's modern day language for testing every single possibility. So if I was to do a brute force attack at the speed of one per second, it would actually take, and this is a mind boggling length of time, it would actually take, well, put it this way, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. 103 quintillion seconds is 240,000 times the history of the universe. <laughs> you, you're not going to guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was not, not going to be a, a, yeah. a suitable ploy to sit here and, and, and try every combination. You're right? not going to guess. And obviously. Um, and they change them every day. And, and they change them every day. And there wasn't just one key. We didn't have to break Enigma once every day. There were up to 20 different keys. The German Luftwaffe used a separate key to the Navy. They used a separate key to different divisions of the Army. The Panzer divisions used separate keys. So we weren't breaking Enigma once every day. We were attempting to break it dozens of times every day. Phil, I understand as well that some human error crept into the system to do with the initial settings of these rotors, which was really important to, to the integrity of the cycle, wasn't it? Indeed. It, it was indeed. And it was human error and I, I guess laziness or a lack of awareness of why it was important from the German operators, which gave us another breakthrough. Um, because they were meant to randomly scramble these wheels every day, every single day, to create a unique um, start position for the messages for that day. Um, but John Herrival, a code breaker here, came up with a theory that maybe they didn't do that. Maybe they were lazy, maybe they didn't realise the, the, the consequences of it. So maybe they only moved them one or two places. So by using that information and testing that theory, we began to um, recognise patterns of behaviour for certain operators. And indeed, some operators use the same password every day, or the same three letters. Um, a, a famous story is um, an operator who uses girlfriend's name. Um, and the girlfriend's name was CIL, um, short for Celia. Um, so CIL, they became known as the Cillies. And that's actually referenced, we talked about the imitation game earlier, that's referenced in the imitation game. Because once we recognise that certain operators were using specific let's just say par passwords in modern day language, using specific ones and not changing them, again, that was another opportunity to circumvent the massive number of combinations that the rotors and the wheels developed. So each little bit of information brought together was another step in breaking Enigma. Yes, the mathematicians were fantastic, and the scientists were fantastic, but a lot of it was behavioural science as well. It was understanding the mistakes the Germans might make. But, but above all, it was picking up, as you quite rightly said earlier, it was picking up on the mistakes and the commonalities and the shortcuts that many of the German operators used during, during the war. And by, by picking up on those, we were able to make such a big difference to the outcome of the Second World War. Should we do a message? Let's do let's, that. Let's, let's do let's a message. Let's see how it works. So, we'll close it back down again. We'll see how this works. My message identifier, I was just going to use this because it's in this state, it could be anywhere. We've got 25, I'm just going to get this thing, 250617. And we said they use passwords, but that 250617 actually is just the position in the alphabet. So the Germans actually have kindly put a nice little uh, guide for us. So 25, that's the letter Y. 06 is the sixth letter in the alphabet, which is F. And 17 is the 17th level now, which is Q. So my unique password for today is YFQ. Um, obviously remembering that I should change this every time, either every day or every message. But as we said before, the Germans didn't change them every day. So we didn't have that complication. But um, what should we send? What, 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 let's do a fairly short word or a name. What would you like to, uh, to? Let's do Normandy. Normandy. The, 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 uh, right, okay. Germans defending for D-Day. Okay, so we'll write down Normandy. One thing I would say about this machine is that it can be fairly temperamental, it is 80 years old, and particularly the letter O might not light up, but okay. that's fine, because actually that would be exactly what happened during the Second World War. Maybe a bulb was broken, maybe there was a loose connection, maybe as they were typing the message a bomb went off and they didn't quite get it. So quite often there would be gaps in the message, but we could still work out what that message says. So, we're going to, if you can encrypt for me the word Normandy, we'll work in pairs like they would have done in the Second World War. Um, if you 
mention that or shout out to me what letter lights up and we'll, okay. we'll try those so out. We're gonna so we're going to hit N. this message, yeah. So we get B. Okay, we've got B. And then O is not lining up. As okay, you suggested. we'll put a dash in that. It happens yeah. occasionally. Yeah. R is X. X. M is E. A is O. O. Yeah. We're up to N. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's O again. Again, yeah. D is Q. It's Q. And then Y is S. It's S. So we've received the message, we've intercepted this message, um, and we've got B. One's been distorted, so we put a dash in there. We've got B dash X E O O Q S. So that's no relevance whatsoever. What does that mean? We don't know what that means. But if we can break the cipher, and we can know the original start positions for those three rotors, we can read that message. So, for the Germans, as long as they know the message identifier, and they've got that communication, because that is part of the message that's been sent to them. It's double encrypted, so it is disguised within the message. But um, they, they've got it, they can reset the machine. So if we reset the machine, we've now got the same setup, um, at the other end, we've got the same message identifier. Now, if we type in, fingers crossed on this one, uh, <laughs> if we type in these letters, we'll get that actually this communication is about Normandy. So, if you want to do the honours again, again, let's press B. We get N. We get N. Obviously, we didn't know which letter was, but we need to keep the sequence going, so press any letter. Okay. Um, and I'll put a dash in there anyway. Yeah. So now, X is the next That's one. That's an X. We get R. Get R. M. No, sorry, E. E. We get M. O. O. This might be where we have a problem because this machine can be temperamental now. Let's oh. press O again. Oh, we get an N this time. Oh, we're excellent, okay. Yeah. So now we've got Q. Yeah, we've got oh, D. I see. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And now, if you press S, we get Y. We get Y. So, even looking at that, even with a couple of letters missing, and this would happen quite often in the Second World War. This would the intelligence services, as well as breaking the ciphers, would also have to, I guess, decipher military German, decipher um, words that have been shortened, work out what the message might be. Although maybe the frequency went. went you know, they couldn't tune into that message properly, but they would still be able to work out what the word said. So even now, if we look at that, what does that say? That's Normandy. I, I feel I can't tell you what a, what a rare thrill it is, that little experiment we just did, knowing the millions and millions of combinations that yeah. can go into this machine. And we've just seen it in action. It's absolutely wonderful. It's, what a wonderful it's, piece of engineering. It's, it's amazing. It's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be working with these machinery and at this location every day. It's a, it's a privilege, which I, I really enjoy, and I'm, I'm glad you've enjoyed it as well. Phil, we're walking next to these quite impressive World War II era huts. And this is really the heart of Bletchley Park, isn't it? The work that was done to decode these messages to, to break Enigma took place in these rather nondescript buildings, didn't it? It, it, it did. Once we realised that the war was going to continue for more than a few months, then these wooden huts were, were built and they were added to throughout the war. Um, we went from initially 70, 70 code breakers up to an industrial unit of code breaking of over 9,000 people. 3,000 people every eight hours coming through the front door. So, so it was a 24-7 operation. But lots of the jobs were actually quite routine and mundane. Um, the operating of the bomb machines, which, um, which is Alan Turin and Gordon Welchman designed, um, was a manual task. It's people putting in wires and brushes um, for hours at a time. Lots of the codes, uh, coded messages weren't so broken. They had to be indexed manually on paper index cards, cross-indexed, so that we would end up with thousands and thousands of cards a day. And some people have estimated there was over six tonnes of paper every couple of weeks of paper index cards uh, recording the information so that it could be referred to in a few weeks' time. Well, I suppose that's crucial, isn't it? Because decoding the message didn't mean much if there wasn't a system for disseminating that information, 
and, and making sure it reached the people it needed to. Quite right, and that's why you've got uh, some of the hats had different functions because even once the message was broken, that would then be passed on to another part of military intelligence. Those messages, once broken, were in German, so we'd need translation teams. We also did Japanese codes here and Italian codes, so you need people translating it. Then you need military experts to interpret that information and then cross-index it. So it was a, it was a huge task, 9,000 people working for, what, six years to get those small little snippets of information to then bring those all together to actually make the contribution that was made here at Bedford Park. Probably the most famous of the code breakers was Alan Turing and That's people right. would have seen the imitation game, the, the movie that, uh, that told his story. From your position as someone who knows this place mm. inside and out, how accurate was that movie in telling the story of Enigma and Bletchley Park? Yeah, we, we, we discuss, discuss it quite a lot. Certainly the setup, the general tenet of it and the, the, probably the opening 20 minutes of the movie, very accurate. But then Hollywood has actually got into it a little bit, shall we say. Um, so we, we tend to say it's about 40-45% accurate. There have been some poetic license added to the spy in the movie as being a codebreaker. There wasn't any codebreakers that were spies. There were people who worked here and ended, ended up we, we identified as being spies. But they never actually found out we were breaking um, the code. So they never knew that um, the, the general I suppose the code-breaking success we had, the Germans never found out. And in fact, they only found out in 1974, <laughs> 30 years after the world had finished. Well, that was essential as well, wasn't it? The yeah. secrecy that, again, if you break the codes and they know you've broken the codes, they're going to change them. Then they will really change them again. So, 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 you know, the marvellous part of the story is Alan Turing, the code-breakers. But, but for me, in many ways, the fact that it was kept secret for so long, it was a combination of those two factors that actually made Bletchley Park such a success.